Let us pray. Father, we uh, come here once again to this section on morality, what it means to be morally pure, morally holy before you. You are a holy God. We are your people. And so tonight, as we study your word, may it be to understand how we, the new people of God in Christ Jesus, may live as your holy people in a world that is not holy. We want to pray tonight for uh, several things. Uh, we want to lift up John, uh, and Lord, he's gone to the hospital. That's Meredith's dad. And we want to pray, Father, for your healing hand on him. We want to pray for our brother Don in hospital. We want to continue to lift up my sister Beth and our sister Carolyn, who continues to heal. Father, we are a people of God, and we are attached, Lord, uh, to those that we love by the grace of Christ. And so we pray that by his grace, his hand may be upon those that we love. For those who are traveling, for those who are with family, for those who are enjoying this eve before Thanksgiving, Lord, we want to pray a blessing on them. Um, but give us uh, insight tonight into your word. But more than that, give us concentration that we may listen carefully to what you have to say to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I mentioned a moment ago, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 12 here tonight, verse 28. Uh, it's important to zoom out to uh, the wider context of what's going on in Mark chapter 12. Um, Jesus has been in various disputes with the Herodians, uh, with Pharisees, with the Sadducees. Uh, these are major parties of Jews at the time. Right? And so they have been coming and challenging Jesus after his triumphal entry. Uh, and trying to, um, in essence, do one of two things, and it's not exactly clear which motive is at play. They either want to get Jesus onto their side, since he's very popular at the moment, uh, and so therefore they can claim that uh, they are among, on the popular movement that has just swept into Jerusalem. Uh, but mostly what they're trying to do uh, is they're trying to trip Jesus up so that he will say something, so that he will lose uh, popularity amongst the people, uh, so that they will gain, hopefully, by his loss. But more than that, uh, they will have a reason to condemn him. Uh, Jesus has run afoul of the various religious leaders at the time, at the least of which because he has spoken ill of the temple. Uh, and you don't speak ill of the temple uh, in um First century Judaism. So it is in the midst of this dispute section that he's approached by a scribe. And now scribes uh, are difficult for us to kind of understand what they do. Uh, Luke calls uh, these same folks lawyers um, because it's kind of what they do. Their job uh, is that, yes, they know how to read and write. They are able to copy over the scriptures. They are the ones who are authorized to make new Torah scrolls to send out uh, into the various synagogues. But because they are making new Torah scrolls to send out to the various synagogues, they also have become experts uh, in those sections, right? If you're copying longhand, right, the five books of Moses, right, including Leviticus, if you're copying it over, over and over and over again, this is your job. This is literally what you do all of the time. Uh, you get to know the text pretty well. You get to know the text pretty well. Uh, and so they were thought of as experts uh, in the Torah, especially in the five books of Moses. So it's one of these scribes in verse 28 that approaches Jesus. And there we read, one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Um, now, this is a, a pretty common rabbinical question at the time, right? The rab great rabbis, um, contemporary with Jesus, a little before him, a little after him, uh, debated uh, this particular question quite a bit. Uh, which one is the greatest of all the commandments, right? Which one is the most important? Which one is the foremost? Um, and they generally had a few answers. Uh, one of the answers would have been, of course, the first commandment. It's the first thing that you read, right? You shall have no other gods before me, or you shall have no other gods in my presence. Um, you shall not worship other gods is another way to understand that text. Uh, and so many would lift up and say, this is it, right? So this singularity of our God, that he is alone the one to be worshipped uh, and the one that we owe our allegiance to, uh, that's the greatest commandment. Uh, there were two other major contenders at the time, and they won't seem obvious uh, until we get to our Leviticus lesson tonight. Uh, and those are the fourth and the fifth commandments. So the commandment uh, to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy, especially in Pharisaic Judaism, 
Uh, Sabbath keeping was uh, pretty much the pinnacle of their existence. Um, they made sure that no one worked on the Sabbath. If Jesus got in trouble with the Pharisees once. He got in trouble with them a thousand times because Jesus would do things on the Sabbath. That is on Saturday, the day of the worship for them. Uh, Jesus would do things on the day of rest uh, that they considered work. Uh, but Jesus pointed out that it is right to do what is good on the Sabbath. Right? It's right to do things that are good, right? So it's not right to let, if you can bring relief to someone's suffering, right, by healing on the Sabbath day, it's not right to tell them they have to wait until tomorrow. Right? That's not right to do, right, to say, well, you have to wait until tomorrow. Uh, if I have the ability and the time uh, right now to do something to aid you, then then that's what we are called to do. Uh, and so the Sabbath day, for especially in Pharisaic Judaism, was very important. But one more commandment rose uh, pretty high. And we're going to encounter this in a couple of different ways uh, in our Leviticus study tonight. Uh, and that is honor thy father and thy mother. Right? And so this is um, especially an important commandment amongst the Sadducees. They uh, viewed this commandment pretty broadly as respecting those who are in authority, since the Sadducees controlled the temple, right? They were in the um, power position in Israel. They controlled, in essence, the center of worship. Uh, and so the respect for authority became uh, very important to them. Uh, honoring father and mother, of course, means honoring the tradition, right? The faith tradition, especially, that your father and your mother pass on to you. Uh, it means more than that, but it certainly doesn't mean any less than that, right? And so those would have been common answers to the question, uh, which commandment uh, is the greatest, roughly contemporary with Jesus? So, but that's not what Jesus says. So let's listen to what he says. Jesus answered, the most important is hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So Jesus here uh, is quoting from Deuteronomy 6.4. It's one of those passages in scripture that's so important. We give it a name uh, it's an, and we take it from the first word of this passage in Hebrew, which is Shema. Shema means listen or hear. It's command. Right. Shema Israel would be how the passage begins. Uh, and so what we have here in this passage is Jesus is lifting that idea out of this important part of the book of Deuteronomy. And he's saying, this is it, that there is one God, right? And this God alone, you love. In other words, this God alone, you serve, this God alone, you worship, this God alone, you praise, right? This one God, right? In fact, you're not just to worship this one God, you're supposed to do it with the whole of your being. Now, Jesus does something interesting here uh, and the scribe down below uh, will use slightly different language. In fact, the scribe is closer to what uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 says. Uh, Jesus uses a more expansive, uh, actually really Hellenistic view of, of the person uh, in, in expanding things out, right? And so he says heart, soul, mind, and strength here in Mark, at least that's how uh, Peter, who reported to Mark, heard it, um, or that's how he translated what Jesus said probably in Aramaic or Hebrew into the Greek. Um, but it's more expansive than what the Shema says, uh, probably because Mark is being written for a Hellenistic or a Greek-minded audience, right? And so their metaphysic, which is what Jesus touches on here, is what he expands on. Okay, but then he goes on, he says, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, right? That is Leviticus 19, 18b. We're going to come across it here in just a little bit. Right? And then he says, there is no other commandment greater than these, right? So he doesn't take anything out of the Decalogue, anything out of the Ten Commandments. Right? He chooses a passage from Deuteronomy and a, pa pardon me, and a passage from Leviticus, and he lifts them up. He says, these are the greatest commandments. In fact, it's um, in, in the Christian life, these two commandments become so important that we believe, as Jesus says elsewhere, that the whole of the law and the prophets hang on these, right? If you do these two things, you will not sin. Now, we don't love perfectly as Jesus calls us to love God, and we certainly don't love one another or your neighbor as yourself uh, perfectly either. Now, to love neighbor as self um, takes a little bit of explanation in our modern world uh, because we've developed a few really strange ideas uh, that are counter to Orthodox Christianity. Uh, one of them is self-love and the other is self-forgiveness. 
Um, Self-love is this idea that, that what Jesus is commanding here, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, means you should love yourself and then extend that, the, saying, the kind of love you show to yourself uh, to other people. Uh, love from uh, especially a New Testament perspective just will not carry that freight. It will not. Love is something that is done between two or more people, right? Love is something that's done between persons, right? And so you have to have a subject, the one who loves, and an object, the one who receives that love, right? And you cannot be both subject and object. In fact, our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? One of the most powerful arguments for the Trinity uh, and, and knowing God is Trinity is that God loves. God loves himself. Uh, and that doesn't make any sense because God would have to have an object, right? And so that's why in uh, a lot of uh, Islamic and even Juda uh, Judaism, um, God, in, in essence, has to create a world because he has to create an object of his uh, affection. Christianity is unique amongst the Abrahamic faiths in that we say, actually, God is complete without creation. Right? Creation is an outworking of the love between the persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But creation is not a necessary thing. It's not something that God has to do to have an object to love because God is both subject and object uh, within himself. Right? And so that's the beauty uh, of the Trinity. But this idea of self-love, uh, certainly it's everywhere, right? You have to love yourself. You have to take care of yourself. You have to do all those things. That's true that you do want to take care of yourself, right? But you shall love your neighbor as yourself is stated elsewhere, like perhaps in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in, in a more colloquial way that you probably know. And it would be something more like this. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Right? That's the essence of what Jesus is saying here. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we're going to come uh, here in a few months to a passage in Luke where the question is, well, who is my neighbor, right? Who is my neighbor, right? And that becomes a very important idea because the question is, right, are we talking about just the people I like or are we talking about everybody? Uh, and in Jesus' uh, beautiful telling of the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, he, said, he really means not just everybody, but even the people that you really don't like. That's who you love, right? Lo and you love in a sacrificial way. So this idea of love of self doesn't work here. What instead we are saying, or what Jesus is saying uh, by this is saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, um, how you want to be treated is how you ought to treat other people, right? And more than that, you have to go a step beyond that, not because your ideas of what it means to treat other people well may actually not be good, uh, and so you have to go a step beyond that and you have to actually take up the love of Jesus, right? And so Jesus demonstrates ultimately what love is by going to the cross and dying on our behalf, right? Dying for our sins, right? And so the love we show to the other, right, is self-sacrificial, right? So we give of ourselves for the sake of the other without uh, necessarily counting the benefit to ourselves. Now, this leads to another uh, related topic um, that you see a lot uh, out there in the culture right now, and it's this idea I have to forgive myself. Um, it's nonsense. You can't forgive yourself. Uh, you have to live with yourself all of the time. Um, you, have to, you, you have to get forgiveness from somebody that you've wronged, right? So David in Psalm 51, it's very clear that against you alone have I sinned, oh God, right? So God, God is the one you need forgiveness from. So the idea that you're forgiving yourself makes yourself God. Um, and that's a big problem. You can't do the first part of this if you're God. You can't, right? You cannot uh, love the Lord your God if he is you, right? And so you have to differentiate yourself uh, from God. You are not God, right? You have to lay down the sin of Adam and say, I'm not the arbitrator of what is right and wrong in the world because I am not God, right? Or as I call it, the first spiritual truth, there's a God and I am not him. Okay, so how does the scribe react to uh, these powerful ideas of Jesus? And again, you could spend hours just talking about the, the great commandment. It's, there is no bottom of depth to Jesus' commandment here. So, But we are going to have to move on because this is a Leviticus study. So let's keep going here into verse 32. The scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, that's much closer to what the original Hebrew says. And to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all uh, whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. 
And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Right, so the scribe answers well, right? And the scribe responds, right? He's a little closer to the original Hebrew than Jesus is. So Jesus is expanding. And of course, since he's the word of God, he gets to do what he wants because he is conveying to a new audience, right? Ultimately to both a Jewish and Gentile audience in a way that they would understand that this means a whole self love of God. And so the scribe responds and says, that, that sounds great. That's exactly right. In fact, if we live that way, that's more important than what we're doing in the temple, right? Remember in Mark chapter 12, the temple is looming in the background the whole time. In fact, what comes very quickly after this in Mark 13 in the small apocalypse of Mark is Jesus telling his disciples that not one stone is gonna be left on top of another. Right. And so the temple is looming large in the background here and all of the sounds and smells of the temple, right? Remember blood and fire, right? Blood and smoke. These are the, the smells of the temple. The sounds are animals and people moving about, right? This is a busy, noisy, smelly place, right? And so he says, actually, all of that is nowhere near as important as what you just said. If we did what you just said, then the offerings that you brought perhaps would be more meaningful, but you might not need to bring those guilt offerings, for instance. When Jesus saw, right, that he answered wisely, he said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. He said, you're close. You're close. You figured out, you know, the truth of how to live life. Now you just need to have life, right? And in order to have life, you need Jesus. And so putting one's trust in Jesus, right, is important. Right, so what betrays the scribe here? Well, it's back in verse 32 where he says, you are right teacher, right? Or you're right rabbi. That's probably what he says. Um, he doesn't call Jesus Lord. Right? And so he, he likes the teaching of Jesus, but he hasn't put his faith in the person of Jesus. And, and as we've talked about in other contexts, that's something you need to do both. Right? You can't do one or the other. We actually need to do both. Okay, so... What's the end of this? Well, it's the end of a dispute. Now, keep this in mind as we come back to this passage uh, where Jesus is citing this in Leviticus 19, because uh, love your neighbor as yourself is actually stated in the uh, for people who are in the midst of a dispute with their neighbor. Right? And so Jesus is disputing with his neighbors, right? but he hasn't lost any love for them. Right? He hasn't lost any love for them. Uh, and after this point, right, when even one of the scribes, right, one of these very important people comes over and says, you know, you're right. You know, I can't argue with you. You're right. Right. And at that point, nobody asks any more questions. Nobody, nobody dares to go up and talk to him. Right. The time for talking is over. Right. Uh, and so Jesus is going to leave uh, quickly. He's going to go out and talk about the uh, both the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD and then the end of the world. Uh, in the uh, small apocalypse of Mark in Mark 13, and then what follows after that is the passion narrative beginning in Mark 14. So that's the context of when this particular passage of Leviticus gets cited uh, in the New Testament. In fact, it, it appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? It's a very important idea, right? And it comes out of the middle of this chapter uh, on moral behavior uh, for Israel, what we might call moral purity. So we're going to uh, jump over uh, to Leviticus 19 tonight. Uh, we're going to make our way uh, through the text uh, fairly quickly um, this evening. So I hope uh, you have your Bibles open and you are ready because we're going to start here in verse 19. We're going to begin uh, with sort of the theme of the chapter in these introductory verses 1 and 2. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I, I stop and I do this all the time in our Sunday morning class. I don't always do it here. Uh, but it's it's really important to notice how often this phrase, right, the Lord spoke, comes up in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus tells you over and over and over again, or at least it purports over and over and over again to be the word of God, right, which should give you us pause that so many people don't want anything to do with this book. I understand it's difficult. We've already covered most of this stuff. It's difficult to understand. It seems strange. It seems foreign. It seems like a a strange new world that we don't know much about. But, and this is very important, it is God's word to you. Right? And so verse one reminds us of that. So verse two sets the theme of the chapter. 
to speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Right? Remember, to be holy is to be uh, set apart right, for a particular or special purpose. Right? So God is apart from his people. Right? Because his purpose is to reign over them, right? His purpose is to redeem them. His purpose is to save them, right? His purpose is to lead them well, right? And so God is set apart from his people. And in fact, there's an elaborate system of the tabernacle that's set up to keep God uh, physically separated from his people. Because remember, going into the presence of God, right, is dangerous business. We just covered that uh, in chapter 16 on the Day of Atonement, right? But this holiness of God also reminds Israel that they are a holy people. They are to be set apart by their particular practices from the surrounding nations, right? They're supposed to look different, right? This is something that's also true for Christians. I know Christians don't like to stand out, right? And we've covered in that, again, that beautiful early church document, you know, Matthias' letter to Dionysius. I cite it all the time. If you haven't read it, send me an email. I will send you a copy it's not very long. You will enjoy it. Um, I know I do. But in Methodist' letter to Dionysius, right, he makes the point uh, over and again that Christians aren't distinguished by their culture, right, by the way we wear hair, by the clothes that we wear, by the food that we eat. But what distinguishes a Christian from the surrounding community is their moral behavior. It's our moral behavior, right? It's our code of conduct that we hold to as Christians. That's what distinguishes us from the surrounding culture and from the surrounding people and it does so in a in a winsome and not a condemnatory way right we're not living this way so that we can look down our noses at people we're living this way because we think it is the best way to be human and right? because this is the way god has shown us right so just as the ancient people of god israel are called to be a holy nation so the new people of god in christ jesus are called to be a holy nation uh, as well but we are not set apart by kosher laws or Sabbath laws. We are set apart by our behavior, by the way we live in this world, by the morals that we live by. Um, and so that's where we're at. So where do we begin? Well, we begin with some commandments then. Right? So if we're going to live as the holy people of God, how shall we do that? Right? We might call these the holy practices of the holy people of God. So he says, every one of you shall revere his mother and his father. And you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. So remember when we talked about uh, those other commandments, right, that, that might have been answered, which one is the greatest? Well, Sabbath keeping and the honoring, or in this case, revering a father and mother, right, are lifted up often as a great, the greatest commandments, right? And probably because of their position here in Leviticus 19. All right, so they're here they're lifted up again, and they are told amongst your moral behaviors, right? These two should be among them, right? So we honor or we revere the, our mother and our father. That means certainly we listen to them in our youth and obey them. Uh, it also means we care for them in their old age, uh, but it means that we live a life, right, that honors them, right? Or another way I put it uh, in recent conversations is. Don't live your life in such a way that people would be ashamed to share your last name. Right? That's honoring the father and mother from a negative perspective. Or live your life that people would be happy to have your name. Right? People would be happy to share a last name with you. Okay. Um, keeping the Sabbath, of course, means not working on the, on the uh, Sabbath day. That would be Saturday at the time, the last day of the week. Uh, but it also means participating in worship as you are able. Uh, and so keeping the Sabbath means a day of rest, a day of prayer, a day of attention to God's word, and a day of worship. So, and then we're reminded, and again, this phrase will come back over and again, I am the Lord your God, right? And anytime you see those small capital letters, that's God's name. I am Yahweh, your God. I am the one who is the one who is your God. That's how it waits to understand that. Okay, so then we get a turn uh, to the second commandment. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. Uh, so the first term idols here probably refers to those made of wood. And then the second term, which is translated in the long phrase, gods of cast metal, uh, is referring to those that are made of metal, probably mostly bronze at the time. Um, and so these um, worship of these uh, 
representations, these physical representations of the gods would seem very strange to us. There's still certainly people in the world that do this. Um, but these physical representations were seen to be manifestations uh, of the God, right? And so you would worship them because uh, it's not that this thing is God, but it's a representative or it captures an essence of what the God is. Uh, and so therefore you worship it, right? And so God is saying, don't worship foreign I, uh, I, idols, but also don't make an idol of me, right? Don't make a physical representation uh, of me, right? So remember the ark in the end is the throne of the invisible God. Okay, so we're gonna reiterate some things that have been said elsewhere in verses five through eight concerning uh, what we've called the peace or fellowship offering. It says, when you offer a sacrifice, a peace offering to the Lord. So remember the peace or the fellowship offering uh, is the one that everybody loves because everybody gets a share, right? The priest gets a portion, the worshiper gets a portion, and God gets a portion, right? Very important. Right? It's a pure act of worship and fellowship with one another and with God. Okay, so when you do this, right? And we, again, we've covered this earlier in Leviticus, but it's being reiterated here. It says you shall offer it so that you may be accepted, right? So don't show up and give a peace offering without giving consideration for how you will then celebrate the peace offering. Okay, it shall be eaten the same day you offer it or on the day after and anything left over until the third day shall be burned up with fire, right? Doesn't matter how, how good the meat was, doesn't matter how much leftovers you have on the third day, it is to be consumed, right? It will be uh, eaten up into the flames. Um, there are some folks who say, okay, well, there's something here about, you know, th third day and Jesus rising from the dead. I can certainly make some connection points there, but I, I don't know that that's exactly uh, the right thing to do uh, with this particular text. Anyways, if it's eaten at all on the third day, it is tainted. It will not be accepted. And everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity because he has profaned what is holy to the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from his people. Okay, I'll make the connection point for you. So the idea here is that if Jesus is in the is in the earth more than three days, then he becomes a, a tainted thing, right? So he has to rise on the third day uh, to remove the taint of death from him. Okay. So why is it that you have to eat the peace offering? You get two days to, in essence, feast, right, on, on it, uh, and then on the third day, well, because it um, it is while well, it was offered, right, and that makes it holy, it's still something that's dead. Right? It's still something that's dead, and there is a point in time in which uh, the taint of death overcomes the holiness of the sacrifice. Right? And that's true in the life of Israel as well, right? So we have these beautiful, wonderful, high holy days. We'll be coming to those shortly. Um, these beautiful, wonderful, high holy days uh, of Israel, right, where there's these great feasts, right? But there's a lot of life in between them, right? And so the joy of the feasts can often... Uh, wear off, right? Or the effect of the sacrifice wears off. This is the beauty of the resurrection of Jesus, because it means the sacrifice of Jesus is still valid, right? It's still the once for all sacrifice as he is seated at the right hand of God. Okay, so let's jump down here into verses 9 and 10. Pardon me, I might sneeze. Okay, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest, and you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so in the ancient world, um, if you were poor, it meant that you did not have your own land to care for. Uh, it may also have meant that maybe your crops had failed that year. Right? And so the idea here is that if you have a successful crop, you don't take all of it, right? So you go through the field, right? And you don't go right up to the edge. In other words, you don't go corner to corner, edge to edge, right? And make sure you get everything. You don't go back over it. That's a different law in a different place, but you don't go back over it and make sure that you get it, right? That's the idea of stripping it bare, that you're making sure you get everything, right? You make one pass through, you, you leave the edges or the corners uh, for uh, people who may need it. So who's going to need it? Well, the poor. These are people who cannot, uh, don't have enough to eat, right? And they can't, um, they they can't buy food, and they don't have the land to grow their food. Same for sojourners, right? So a sojourner is a non-Israelite living in the land of Israel, right? So they are held to the laws of Israel since these are national laws, 
Uh, but there's one thing that a sojourner can never do in Israel, and that is own land, right? And so they're always a vulnerable population. Right? And so they too have to be cared for by uh, the provision that God is giving to the people, right? Now, there's an important thing to note here, and, and I've made this point uh, in our Sunday morning class, and I want to make it here as well. Um, yes, this is a way of feeding the poor, and it is important to feed the poor, but the poor have to go out and get it. Right? They have to go out and get it. Right? It's not, you know, don't harvest up to the edge of your field and then go back over and, and you know, fix, fix it up and, and harvest it and then deliver it to the people who may be in need. No, the idea there is, look, it's there for the taking, you know, even if you don't have enough to eat, you can go out and get enough food, you know, for you and for your family by going out to the fields and gleaning from the various fields, right? But you have to go and do it. You can't sit and wait and hope that something comes to you. You are told, no, you have to go out and actually do the work to bring in the food. So important concept. Verses 11 and 12, you do not, uh, you shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not lie to one another, you shall not swear by my name falsely, and so proclaim the name of your God, I am the Lord, right? So the idea here is this is a progression of sins that happen so often in this way. You can read them all separately, but it's pretty easy to see the story that God is telling here. Like first you stole something, right? Or you swindled somebody, right? Deal falsely, right? You stole something or you, or you dealt falsely, right? So you sold the stolen goods, right? You swindled somebody else out of some money, right? And then you get caught, right? And you lie about it, right? And then somebody says, you're lying. So you swear by God's name that you are telling the truth and you didn't swindle that guy and you certainly didn't steal from that other guy, right? And so the idea here is one sin tends to be uh, lead to more sin, right? It's not that we sin just this one little way uh, and then there's no more sin in our life. Rather, it's saying that uh, one sin tends to lead us to uh, more sin and more sin and more sin. Uh, and so stop it before you start. Stop it before you start, right? Because in the end, what you will do is profane the name of God, right? In other words, instead of bringing honor to God who you love, uh, you will bring dishonor shame to the name of God, right? You profane his name. So don't do that. Um, pretty simple. Harder in practice. Okay, verse 13. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the death or put a stumbling block before the blind. But you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. Right. So the idea here is, can I treat my uh, neighbor or inferior in such a way that it advantages me and disadvantages them, especially when the power dynamic is such that I am in power uh, and I can reasonably assume that I can treat this person poorly uh, and nothing bad will happen to me as a result of treating this person poorly. Right. So there you get the pretty uh, in vivid imagery of um putting a stumbling block in front of the blind or cursing out the deaf, right? Just because they can't hear you doesn't mean it's right for you to say those things. Just because they can't see it doesn't mean you are okay to bully them, uh, so to speak, right? And the reply of God to this is you shall fear your God, right? Because even though you think you can get away with these things, God sees it all, right? You're never going to escape the eye of God. Right? You're never going to do something where God does not know, God does not see, God does not care. Right? And so treat those, you know, who are less fortunate, as we sometimes say, uh, than yourself with love and care, uh, not with scorn, contempt, uh, and exploitation. Verses 15 and 16. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. Now, remember, uh, trials at the time are, are public uh, things. They are done uh, largely conducted by uh, elders of clans tribes or beyond um, and as a result of that um, every they, they become community events right and so witnesses are called forward and the witness has to go forward uh, and say something but they also you may also be put in a position where you have to decide whether somebody is telling the truth or not right you have to decide uh, what is to be done right? and so the temptation there is to sort of pick a side right so you say well you know this I'm poor and this guy's poor and poor people are pretty good people in my book. It's all those rich people that are the big problem, right? 
Um, I always remind people, you know, by historical standards, if you uh, are had enough to eat today and you know you're going to be sleeping in a place uh, that is warm and dry, um, by historical standards, you're very rich, right? You're among the you're among the rich here. But we have you know different levels, and we can see things uh, in our culture where we can see certainly people are more or less advantaged by their financial uh, picture. So the idea there is well. So maybe the poor, right? We should assume that the poor, you know, we already have just said you have to help the poor. So maybe the poor are really just by, by rule because, you know, we have to help them. They must be, they must be good, right? And so they must always tell the truth. Um, and you don't have to hang around uh, people who are destitute long to know that there are bad people who are poor just as well as there are bad people who are rich, right? And so the other side of this partiality is deferring to the rich, right? Deferring to the great saying, well, this person, you know, is famous or this person has money or this person has whatever um, business power or whatever the case may be. This person has, you know, something that makes them great. Uh, and so therefore they must be good people. And the answer to that is no, right? If, if you've been paying attention to our culture over the last, oh, I don't know, at least decade, uh, you will see that the great are um, certainly not morally superior. They want us to think that a lot of times, but that's not true, right? So the poor aren't better than everybody else and the rich aren't better than everybody else. Everybody is a bunch of dirty, rotten sinners who need a savior. That's my takeaway from that passage. Okay, but you also need to be an honest dealer in court, right? So you can't slander and you can't stand up against the life of your neighbor, right? So you can't do things uh, in such a way that you are using untruth right, to have consequences on the punishment of your neighbors, right? You can't lie about somebody in a courtroom, right, so that they get what you think they deserve, right? That would be a partiality. That'd be slander, right? And standing up against uh, the life of your neighbor uh, is something along the lines uh, of going into the courtroom uh, knowing full well that you are not going to tell the whole truth and you are going to tell the story in such a way um, that it puts your neighbor in the worst possible light, right? So those are not things we are to do. We serve a God of justice, and so we are to seek true justice uh, in the way we conduct our world. Okay, so here's the important passage from 19. So says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him, right? So remember, when Jesus cites this, he's in the middle of disputes with various Jewish leaders at the time. Okay, so there is a dispute that's going on, but Jesus doesn't hate them. In fact, the scribe who comes up to him at the end, Jesus says, what? You're not far from the kingdom of God, right? You're, you're right there. Just you got one more thing you got to do. Right? Put your, I'm not, not just your teacher. I'm your king. I'm your Lord. I'm your God. Right? You put your faith in me. Okay. So you're going to reason together, frankly, with your neighbor. You're going to talk it out. You're not going to come to blows right? Unless you incur sin because of him, right? And so even if your neighbor is acting obnoxiously, you don't give in to that, right? You have to rise above. You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against the sons of your own people, right? So vengeance and grudges, right? So vengeance is, act, is acting out on animosity towards somebody who has done something either purposefully or accidentally to harm you, right? And a grudge is sort of internal seething over a past wrong. Right? And so God says, these things will destroy you, right? My people, they will destroy my people if you give in to these things. So don't do them. In fact, and so because we can't just remove negative behavior, we have to replace it with positive behavior, right? What is the positive things? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, right? So you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, you are going to put the need of your neighbor before yourself. So rather than vengeance or grudge, you are going to say, okay, how can I better serve you right, as, as a reflection of my God who has served me? So we cover this in pretty big detail with Jesus. So, um, but just keep in mind that this passage right here in Leviticus 19, 18 uh, is crucial because of its connection to the ministry of Jesus. Okay, let's move on down the road here to verse 19 shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. Okay. So 
this is the theme for what's going to come after this. It won't all quite make sense, but stick with me here. The idea here is God has set limits, right? God has set limits or God has set boundaries. Right? And so we don't cross the boundaries that God has set up, right? We don't cross the boundaries that God has set up. There's a proper way of doing things and you don't, and the proper way of doing things is God's and you don't mix things that should not be mixed, right? This isn't a statement about marriage or anything like that. All that's ridiculous, right? Human beings are all uh, of one race, right? We're all human beings, right? So all of that's just well and good. Instead, what we're talking about here are, you know, seemingly strange little things, but little things, if you do the little things, then the big things become easier. Um, there was a, a longstanding uh, writer for the band Van Halen. You probably, some of you may know this story, right? And so Van Halen, uh, especially in the David Lee Roth days, right, had this thing in the writer where they said um, that they needed a, a quart bowl of only green M&Ms, right? So the bowl could only have green M&Ms uh, in it, right? No other color, nothing else. It had to be just full uh, of green M&Ms, right? And so for years, right, this was just all oh, these horrible rock stars, right? They had this, um, you know, they just only wanted to eat green M&Ms and they're just so weird and they just want to, you know, treat people poorly. Well, uh, some years later, I think it was with Rolling Stone, David Lee Roth was doing an interview and the interviewer said, okay, what was up with the bowl of green M&Ms? He goes, oh, well, that's easy. He says, we had uh, pyrotechnics involved in our show, right? And so we, we sent over the rider, which was something like, you know, 70 pages long, right? It had detailed instructions about setting up uh, the stage in such a way that our pyrotechnics uh, wouldn't kill us. Uh, and so when we walked into the dressing room, uh, and we didn't see the bowl of green M&Ms, we knew for certain that they didn't read the writer. And we'd go out and we'd send our people, we'd send our roadies out to go and check the setup. And sure enough, we always found something wrong, right? And, and something in, in a few instances that would, kill, that would have killed somebody. Right? And so the idea here is, here's these little ones, right? Don't mix cattle breeds together, right? Don't sow uh, two kinds of seeds in the same field, right? Don't wear a garment of two different kinds of material, right? Um, this idea here is saying, look, if you can do these little things, then the bigger things that are going to follow uh, will be easier for you, right? So pay attention to the small things, right? Because the small things will eventually add up into the big things. Let me tell you a biblical story about that, right? It's the story of uh, the denial of Jesus by the apostle Peter, right? So who does Peter deny Jesus to? Well, twice to a servant girl. And a servant girl would mean um, that she was uh, 12 years old or younger. So you're talking Lucy or Karen's age, right? And so um, twice he's confronted by a servant girl, once, you know, kind of by a bunch of guys who are just standing around outside, right? But he denies Jesus to these people because he thinks they don't matter, right? Peter is there. He, I mean, he is ready to give testimony. He's going to bust in there. He's going to be the hero. He's going to do all sorts of stuff. He's going to say, if you're going to put him, him to death, you're going to have to go through me first. You know, that kind of stuff is probably what Peter's thinking. And then after, you know, these people that don't matter, right? He said, you know, basically, I don't know the guy. Leave me alone. I don't know what you're talking about, right? In other words, you're not important enough to get the truth out of me. That's when the cock grows. And that's why G Peter weeps bitterly, right? In fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy about him, right? Because Peter has, has failed to recognize that the small and the insignificant, especially that girl, that servant girl, still matter, right? And in fact, if you paid attention to doing the right things in the small matters, then when you get to the larger matters, uh, you, will, you will find it a lot easier. Right. This is called practicing virtue, by the way. You're looking for a term for it. Okay, so think, speaking of things that should not mix, right? So a free man and a slave woman should not mix. If you're going to marry a slave woman, which certainly can happen in Israel, there's no problem with that. You have to redeem her first. Right? You have to redeem her first. You have to pay her ransom. In other words, you have to pay off whatever debt that she owes or whatever price it is to make her a free woman, and then you can marry her. 
right? But now we're going to mix two things that don't belong together, a free man and a slave woman. Now, keep in mind, the slave woman is not in trouble in this passage, right? In this passage, because this is not a mutual relationship, right? Because, right, and I'm not trying to, you know, use modern terminology, but there is a clear power differentiation, right? So here you have a free man, you have a slave woman. She is certainly not on the same social plane as the free man. And so he takes advantage of her, right? And God doesn't like that so much, right? You've mixed things that should not be mixed. So here's what happens. The man lies sexually with a woman who is a slave assigned to another man and not yet ransomed or given her freedom, right? So this is, a, she can be set free. You could marry her, right? You could have a, a marriage relationship with her. Absolutely, not a problem. But you didn't do the right thing, right? You stole something, so to speak, from this woman and uh, ostensibly from the man uh, that she works for, right? Okay. So you haven't, she hasn't been ransomed. She hasn't been given her freedom, right? She, so sometimes you have to pay to set her free. Sometimes you say, I'd love to marry this woman, right? And out of kindness, uh, the man who is her master in, the, in that sense of the word uh, would say, you know what? Go and be happy. Go and be free. So she doesn't have her freedom, right? A distinction shall be made. They shall not be put to death. Right now, usually for fornication and adultery, death is what is the result, right? So Israel has a very high standard on this particular topic right? because she was not free, right? Because of her slave status, right? because she is not able to give consent, right? She's not in trouble. And so she's not to be put to death, right? There's no mutuality in this relationship, but he is in trouble, right? In fact, he's in big trouble, right? And so he shall bring his compensation to the Lord at to the entrance of the tent of meeting, a ram for a guilt offering. He sinned. He has to deal with that in a ritual way, right? And so the priest will make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering before the Lord for his sin that he has committed, and he shall be forgiven for the sin that he has committed, right? He committed a sin. He will be marked by that sin, but he shall be forgiven, right, and able to go forward. Now, the idea here, uh, according to Sklar earlier on, uh, in, in the passage is not yet ransomed or given her freedom implies that what he has then to do because he has violated this woman, right? And her honor is he has to marry her, right? He has to pay the price or ask for her freedom uh, so that he can make her an honest woman, right? That's the idea that's coming here. It's an old fashioned concept according to many of our young people, but frankly, I wish it'd come back. This idea that marriage is important. Um, and that marriage makes us honest and good and moral. Okay, verse 23. Okay. So things that don't mix, right? You don't eat food, uh, fruit from trees before they have been given as first fruit to God. Okay? And for fruit trees, that takes four years. Okay? When you come to the land and plant any kind of tree for food, then you shall regard its fruit as forbidden. So you don't eat it. Don't mix with it. Right? This is forbidden fruit. Three years it shall be forbidden to you. It must not be eaten. And in the fourth year, all its fruit shall be holy and offering a praise to the Lord. Now, if you ever planted trees, you know, in the first couple of years, you're not really expecting much fruit. But in the fourth year, right, any fruit that did grow on them is not for you, right? And so in the fourth year, the fruit that then comes, uh, you bring to the Lord as a first fruit offering. Uh, and then in the fifth year, Right, verse 25, but in the fifth year you may eat of its fruit to increase its yield for you, I the Lord your God. So the mixing here right, is taking that which does not belong to you or that which is not yet redeemed, right? So you don't mix that way, right? It's not dissimilar to what's going on with the slave woman, right? She is not yet redeemed, right? And so you do not mix with her. Same thing here, the fruit is not yet redeemed, and so you do not mix it with your body. You don't mix it with your body. Okay, now what follows uh, after this is a series of ideas of don't mix with the pagans, right, and pagan practices, right? So keep away from these various pagan practices. They are not to be your practices, okay? 26, you shall not eat any flesh with blood in it. Now, we've already talked about not eating blood. Chapter 17 was a big treatise on not eating blood and the importance of blood for ritual purposes we've already covered. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is eating flesh with blood in it um, 
for some kind of magic, right? Or some kind of divination, some way that you think that by doing this, you're going to be able to tell the future. Doesn't make sense to us, made sense to the Israelites at the time, probably something coming out of Egypt, right? You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes, right? It's very tempting to want to know what's coming into the future, but interpreting omens and telling fortunes uh, means that we are beginning to incorporate pagan practices, right? Um, it's a strange thing in our world that people still continue to go to fortune tellers or read their horoscopes or anything along those lines. Right? None of this actually um, can tell you anything about, about the future. Uh, and as a Christian, uh, I would say pretty definitively, you should not participate in these things. Right? Tarot card readings are pagan practices. They are not for Christians. Okay, you shall not round off the hair of your temples or mar the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves, I am the Lord. All right, so 27, 28 are dealing with pagan mourning practices. So what do we do in, in the sight of death as pagans? Well, men uh, and perhaps women also make uh, changes to their appearance, changes to their hair. They cut their bodies as a sign of mourning. It's something that Shiite Muslims still do, by the way. Um, and then they tattoo uh, themselves uh, in such a way uh, that marks them as grieving or as mourning. Right? And so we don't participate in the pagan practice of divination, of telling the future. We don't participate in pagan mourning. That's not who we are. We are the people of God. We believe that our God raises the dead. Uh, and so we mourn in a different way, right? In a way that it makes us distinguished and distinct people. Okay, so that largely, uh, because we've come once again to this phrase, I am the Lord, right? We kind of come to the end of that section of mixing, right? And so we're going to come down here and we're going to talk about uh, what we might call the miscellaneous law, certain 29. It says, do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute, lest the land fall into prostitution and the land become full of depravity, right? You shall keep my Sabbath in reverence, my sanctuary, I am the Lord, right? So prostitution and worship and the sanctuary, those things seem unrelated to us, but remember at the time, sex and worship are seen in most pagan practice as belonging together. Right? I remember uh, having a conversation with an Old Testament professor in seminary. He said, you know, imagine for just a minute um, how hard uh, the worship of Yahweh was to sell to young men, right? especially after the conquest of Canaan fails, Israel has gone and settled in the land, there is pagan practice around them, not the least of which would be Asherah worship, stone worship uh, in Asherah, at least in some ideas of, of what it entailed, meant te temple prostitutes, right? And so it's like, okay, well, here's your choices, right? You can uh, worship Yahweh, which means a life of holiness, right? Of living in a way that you are um, taking seriously sacredness uh, in your life, purity in your life, morality in your life, or alternatively, you can go worship the Asherahs or the Baals, uh, and the, when you go into worship, you get to sleep with a prostitute. Tough sell. Um, it's amazing that Judaism survived, right? It's amazing Judaism survived, but it survived because it's the truth, right? So that's the connection between prostitution and the Sabbath, right? It doesn't seem in the sanctuary. It doesn't seem uh, to have a connection point for us. Uh, but that would be the connection point at the time. So what, what is it? Well, we're not going to participate, right? We're not going to participate in pagan worship practices. So letting your daughter become a cult prostitute for a pagan god right, is not something that Israel can do, right? In fact, if that happens, then the land is going to be full of depravity, right? You're going to fall into paganism. Paganism brings with it depravity, right? which is exactly what does happen to Israel uh, in their history. Right, so instead, what, what is the uh, balm for this? Well, it's good religious practice. Keep the Sabbath, reverence the sanctuary, participate in worship. Right? Or as I tell parents, make your kids go to church. I know that's not popular with, our, with my generation and below. Um, it's this idea that somehow not taking our kids to church is giving them freedom. Um, and for the Christian, freedom is defined as doing what is right. And so participating in worship is the right thing to do. Okay, back to fortune tellers. In this case, we're going to be communicating with the dead, right? So do not turn to mediums or necromancers. These are people who do magic uh, for the dead or try to conjure the dead. 
Um, we meet one of these uh, in First Samuel eventually, the Witch of Endor, who is trying to, or actually does summon the spirit of Samuel uh, to talk to Saul, and Samuel proceeds to, in essence, just chew Saul out. It says, do not seek them out, and so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God, right? This is not for you. Don't do these things. And so one of the things uh, in First Samuel, when Saul does this, right, is showing you that he has completely lost the plot, right? He's fallen so far into depravity. He's a monster. He's not even really a man anymore. Okay, so we're going to come back full circle to the reverence of uh, parents, right? And so here it's a general view of those who have attained uh, to an older age. It says, you shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God, I am the Lord, right? Stand up before the gray head and honor the face of a man. We are probably talking about the elders of Israel at this point, uh, probably in a court setting or in another formal setting. Uh, but the idea here is that you will show reverence and respect to those that God has put into positions of leadership over you. Uh, and you will show reverence and respect uh, to those who have obtained to an older age because they probably have something to tell you. That youth or the arrogance of youth uh, has certainly been exacerbated since the uh, baby boomer generation, uh, but the arrogance of youth uh, predates the baby boomers, I should say. Um, and as a result of that, we have lost this idea that those who have uh, lived a good long life have something to teach the rest of us. And that's what we're being told here. Okay, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall do him no wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So God says, remember how you got treated in Egypt at the end and were made slaves? Don't do that to sojourners. That they are to be treated uh, with respect and kindness as they live among you, right? You, just because they are not Israelites does not mean you get to exploit them. So that's what God is telling his people. He says, you shall do no wrong in judgment, in measures of length or weight or quantity. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah and a just hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And you shall observe all my statutes and my rules and do them, I am the Lord. Right. So just weights and measures, right? Uh, it's actually in our constitution. Um, it's really important, right? Because we have to have honest business dealings, right? And if you have unjust weights and measures, you can't deal honestly with each other, right? Somebody's trying to swindle somebody. Right? And so God says, look, there have to be uh, set measures for these things, uh, and you can't put your thumb on the scales, right? Because God, right, has saved you out of Egypt. Therefore, he is the one who can direct how you shall live, right? He has redeemed you as his people, and so he shall direct how you, how then you shall live, right? Just as we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, so therefore Jesus Christ can direct, therefore, how we shall live. Okay, let's cover um, pretty quickly. We talked about uh, these sins that we're going to cover here in chapter 20. Um, so if we, in chapter uh 18, we kind of ran down the list of sins, most of them being sexual, but also the worship of Moloch. Uh, and now chapter 20 says, okay, if you have engaged in those particular sins, sexual sins with uh, family members who are too close, uh, or um, the worship of Moloch, or we're going to come also into the use of necromancers and mediums, right? So if you participate in pagan worship, right, or uh, un- uh, authorized sexual relationships with family members who are too close to you. Uh, this is what this is what happens. It, by the way, worship of Moloch uh, is the sacrifice of children for the benefit of the adults. Okay, so we're reminded again, verse one, always worth our time to pay attention to. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, so this is God's word. It's God's word to you as well. Say to the people of Israel, any one of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel who give any of his children to Moloch shall surely be put to death. Now, as a Christian, you should abhor Moloch worship, right? The sacrifice of children for the benefit of their parents or the benefit of adults, right? You should abhor this as a Christian. But when we deal with the death penalty in the Old Testament, right, these are particular laws, right, for the kingdom of Israel. Right, the particular laws for the kingdom of Israel. We do not live in the kingdom of Israel. We live in the United States of America. We live under the laws of the United States of America. And so we do not put people to death. So one way we need to understand these various punishments that are going to be told here, right? So death, which is pretty obvious what it is, 
to be cut off means exile, right? And to be childless means uh, perhaps supernaturally that you will be made barren. In other words, you will not bear children, but it probably means um, legal in a legal sense that your children are disinherited, right? So the land that has belonged to your family for generations, your children don't get to keep it and your name is wiped from the land. So those are the big punishments here, right? And so these punishments for these particular sins tell you that they're very serious, right? They're very serious. So if you see the death penalty assigned to something, especially the death penalty assigned to something, right? It means this is an egregious sin, right? They cannot, you, you, you cannot let this kind of evil live in your midst, right? So the worship of Moloch, cannot live in the midst of God's people, right? So if somebody does that, they have to be put to death, right? The people of the land shall stone him with stones. So it's not just death, right? They actually are killed uh, with the stones of the land. In other words, the earth rises up. So remember, we talked about the land and the land having a personality, right? We looked at some passages from Romans chapter eight, right? And the land having this personality and vomiting out uh, Israel, Right. So the land itself rises up in the hands of the people and destroys the evil from your midst. Right. In other words, the land, the innocent blood of those children is crying out and the land in the hands of the people rises up to destroy the evil. It says I myself will set my face against that man. Right. And will cut him off from among his people because he has given one of his children to Moloch to make my sanctuary unclean, pray my holy name. Lots of ways of understanding what, what God is saying in verse three. I think the simplest way and the way we as Christians would certainly understand this is God is saying, and if you do this, you're irredeemable. You're irredeemable. Right? The murder of children for your benefit is irredeemable. You, you will be cut off from your people, not just in this world, right? Because you're already dead, but cut off forever. In other words, you will not be among God's people in glory. And if the people of the land do all do at all close their eyes to that man when he gives one of his children to Moloch and do not put him to death, then I will set my face against that man and against his clan and will cut them off from among the people, him and all who follow him and whoring after Moloch. Right. So let's say this is, you know, it's a family member, it's a friend of yours, and you find out he's done this horrible thing, and you're like, you know, do we really want to, you know, put Bob to death or Jerry to death or Cindy to death, right? Do we really want to do that? And God's saying, look, if you don't, right, then the punishment will spread to the entirety of the clan, right? In other words, the clan will be cut off, right? Put into exile, right? The clan uh, uh, that's, you know, this what we might call extended family unit, right? The clan itself is going to be removed from the land and no longer have an inheritance in the land of God. Right? Plus, if you don't purge this evil from your midst, it has a tendency to spread. Right? It has a tendency to spread. So you have to deal with Moloch worship, you have to deal with it right away. Okay, so what about magic? If a person turns to mediums and necromancers whoring after them, I will set my face against that person and cut them off from among these people. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. For anyone who curses his father and mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood is upon him. All right. So two things book in this with a big statement in the middle. On the one hand, if you participate in divination through the use of people who say they can contact the dead, whether that's true or not, right, then you will be cut off. You're going to be sent off into exile. And you are told that you are to be a holy people, consecrated, set apart, made holy for your holy God. Right? And so how will then shall you live? By keeping the commands of God. Right? Because God is the one who has made you holy, that sanctifies you. Right? And then we're told on the end of, other end of that, right? So if you are trying to contact the dead, you're probably trying to contact your ancestors for some guidance. Right? But on the other end of that, we're told, look, if you do that, you're cursing your father and your mother, right? And even if it's outside of that context and you are doing the opposite of the commandment of honoring father and mother, right? You are cursing their name, right? You're shaking an angry fist at them, right? You're rolling your eyes as a teenager at your mom and dad. You're in serious trouble, right? So cursing here is more than, you know, popping a little attitude of mom and dad. Cursing here is, is saying, I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead, right? That's what the prodigal son does to his father, by the way, when he asks for his inheritance. 
And so his father has every right to bring him before the elders and to put him to death. Right. So if you curse your father or your mother, right, your blood is upon you. In other words, you are guilty of a sin. And so you can't blame other people for what is going wrong. Right. Which is typically why we curse mom or dad is because we're blaming them for something that's going wrong in our lives. God says, nope, this is your fault. You are the one that chose to curse your mother and your father. Right? So don't do that. Okay, sexual immorality. We're going to cover this uh, in fairly quick order here. All right, so we covered uh, sexual um, relationships that are too close, right, of relatives uh, to be authorized. And so we're not going to really run down through all of these, but there is a slight differentiation between uh, two sets of these. So we're going to deal with that. Okay, so if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulterer shall be put to death, right? So generally, adultery, right? People are married, you're married, she's married, you're both married doesn't matter, you commit adultery, death is a result. Now, when this happens in uh, John chapter eight and the woman caught in adultery gets dragged before Jesus, one of the problems with that story uh, is he the, is it takes two to tango, so to speak, and he's not there, right? He's not there. In other words, they've just dragged the woman forward to be put to death, but the man, right? Basically good old boys club, the man has not been brought forward with her. So that's one of the problems right, that, that is going on in the text, and probably one of the reasons that Jesus doesn't uh, put her to death and instead shows mercy. But what does he tell her at the end? He says, is there no one left to condemn you? She says, no one, sir. He says, then neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more, right? It's not what you did was fine. What you did was sin, and you are forgiven. Now go and see that it never happens again, right? That's what Jesus says. Okay, so adultery in general, Ten commandment, break ten commandment, death is what comes. Okay, if a man lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness, both of them shall surely be put to death, their blood is upon them, right? So this is um, stepmother, so to speak, and stepson, and that is a uh, forbidden relationship, and death is the result. Why? Because you've shamed your father, right? You've brought a curse upon your father. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall be surely be put to death, they have committed perversion, their blood is upon them. Again, it is this intergenerational curse and you have done something too close, right? And so it, uh, you have engaged in this, then it is on you. Okay, 13, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them, right? So remember we talked about, you know, don't, there, there is a proper order to things. There are things that should be brought together, right? And two men, right, are not the proper order because they cannot produce offspring. Right? They cannot produce offspring. Um, and since the Genesis mandate uh, is in effect, that's Genesis 128, be fruitful, multiply, et cetera, um, then relationships that cannot produce children are not uh, to be thought of as authorized relationships. We're going to talk a little bit about that on Sunday. If a man takes a woman and her mother also, it is depravity. He and they shall be burned with fire. There, there may be no depravity among you. Right? So you cannot take a, a multiple wives. We talked about that a little bit in chapter 18 uh, and certainly not a woman and her mother, right? That is depravity, right? And so no depravity is, among, uh, is to be among uh, the people. A man lies with an animal. He shall surely put to death and you shall kill the animal. If a woman approaches any animal and lies with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. The blood's upon it. Again, a relationship that cannot produce offspring. Uh, and so therefore, uh, it has to be purged from among the people. Okay, so these other uh, these other relationships are too close, right? They're too close of relationships to produce legitimate offspring, and so therefore the evil has to be purged. Okay, let's jump down here into verse 17, shall we? If a man takes a sister, a daughter of his father, or a daughter of his mother, so this would be a half-sister or perhaps a stepsister, and sees her nakedness and she sees his nakedness it is a disgrace right not a perversion a disgrace and they shall be cut off in the sight of the children of their people he has uncovered his sister's nakedness and he shall bear his iniquity so that's exile now in some ideas exile basically is death right you're being cut off from among your people you have to go live out in the wilderness um, you have to make your own way in the world without the support of a community right and in the ancient world that's pretty much a death sentence 
Okay, if a man lies with a woman during her menstrual period and covers her nakedness, he has made uh, naked her fountain and she has uncovered the fountain of her blood. Both of them shall be cut off from among uh, their people. Right. So we've said, uh, we covered this earlier, that there is a time that that could happen by accident, but if you do it on purpose, exile. Okay, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister or your father's sister, for that is to make naked one's relative. They shall bear their iniquity. Okay, so that means that you have to deal with that particular sin in an appropriate way, and the appropriate way uh, is probably going to be childlessness, right, which is what will come down here. If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness, she shall bear their sin, they shall die childless, right, that doesn't mean that they will be barren, it means that if any children were produced in the relationship, they will not inherit, right, they will not be part of it. Um, there are some points in the scripture in which God supernaturally does close the womb, so to speak. And so therefore children do not result, but that certainly does happen. So we don't want to say that that is outside the realm of possibility, but the more usual application of this um, would be that these people um, would be written out of the inheritance, right? So they no longer have a place uh, for their descendants in the land. The man takes his brother's wife, it is impurity, he has uncovered his brother's nakedness, they shall be childless. So what we find in these bottom relationships is that we've moved a little, uh, these relationships we just covered, we've moved a little bit further out, right? So there's not quite that closeness to these relationships starting here in verse 17, right? And so because we've moved a little bit further out, right, in what's going on here, then the punishment becomes less severe. Right, so exile or disinheritance. At any rate, we just say, you know, if you want to talk about a, le uh, a section of scripture that the modern world does not like, um, any section of scripture dealing with sexual morality, uh, people don't like. Um, we, uh, you know, are we under the law that, you know, we have, to, we don't, that we put people to death or we exile them or these things? No, certainly not as Christians the moral imperatives here remain the same, uh, and that is we have to be careful to uh, choose um, appropriate marriage partners, right? So people who are not closely related to us, um, we have to be able to choose a marriage partner as a man, a woman, or as a woman, a man, right? Where procreation, no matter how uh, remote the possibility, is still a possibility, and that means one type of relationship, a, a, a marriage relationship between a man and a woman, right? We have to take those things seriously, and especially in this day and age, because so many people would rather uh, discard these ideas, right? So we dealt with, you know, these particular sins and talked a little bit about why they uh, would be considered uh, sinful and why God says that they are sinful at the time. Um, and so now we've dealt with, you know, so if you have fallen into these sins, this then is what's going to happen. Okay, so we're going to get a general um, statement at the end here about the land again, beginning in verse 22. It says, you shall therefore keep my statutes and all my rules and do them that the land where I'm bringing you to live may not vomit you out. So remember, the land has a personality, right? The land is crying out with the innocent blood of Molech worship, right? And is crying out to be cleansed. And that's what Israel is supposed to go in and do as they drive the Canaanites out. They're supposed to cleanse out the necromancers and the mediums and the Molech worshipers and the Astro worshipers and the Baal worshipers, right? They're supposed to push these people uh, out of the land and put an end to their culture, even if, by, even if by death, right? That's what they're supposed to do. But if Israel goes into the land, Right, and fails to follow the commands of God and falls into the same sins, which is really what we've been dealing with, right? Is various sins of the of the pagan cultures around them, right? Necromancy and cursing of parents and Moloch worship and sexual morality, right? If they fall into those sins, then the land will once again cry out to be cleansed. Right? You shall not walk in the customs of the nations that I'm driving out before you, for they did all these things and therefore I detested them. That's if you want to pick out a few words you don't want to hear from God, I detest you, right? Something you don't want God to say to you. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. In other words, I took you away from Egypt. Don't go and be like the Canaanites, right? I took you out of Egypt so you would not be like the Egyptians. 
Don't turn around and go and be like the Canaanites, right? You are to be a distinguished and distinct people. And the same thing is true for Christians today in a different mode, but still true today, right? Christians are not known for our dietary laws. We're not known for the clothing that we wear. We're not known for um, our, our rules about Sabbath keeping, right? What we are to be known in our communities and what is to distinguish us is our moral behavior. Right, our moral behavior. Right? We are separated from the world, not in the sense that we live in a place that is outside of um, secular society, so to speak, outside of the rest of the world, but we live in such a way right, that we answer to a higher authority in how we conduct our lives. And that's what keeps us separated from the world around us, but it's also what includes us in the world around us as well. You shall therefore separate the clean bees from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean, right? So again, we're talking about kosher laws here. Right? And this idea here is that if you do these little things, it will help you understand and be distinguished in the big things and the moral things as well. Right? You shall not make yourself detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. You shall be holy to me for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that, pardon me, that you should be mine. Right. So again, one of those little things. Right. So if you keep virtue in little ways, then when you are called to keep virtue in big ways, you're going to do it. Right. So keeping kosher. Right. Is a constant reminder of the things you can and cannot eat. So therefore, you will be more mindful of the way you live your life in other areas of the ways of the um, say sexual relationships you can and cannot engage in of the worship that you can and cannot do. Right? So if you do these a thousand little virtuous things every day, then when you are put to the test, you have built up, so to speak, a muscle of virtue in your life so that you can stand before it. Right? More than that, you're supposed to be separate from the nations around you. You're not supposed to be like them. Right? You're not supposed to be like them. You are a separate people. Right? You should have behaviors in your life as a Christian that distinguish you from your unbelieving neighbors. Right? Not the least of which, as a Christian, is that you uh, participate in Sunday worship. That distinguishes you right away from everyone else. Right? Sunday morning, it's not for football, it's for Jesus. That would distinguish you. In our culture right now, that's, that's how bad it's gotten. Okay. And then we get a strange text, and I never, I always think that this kind of fell out of where it belonged a little earlier, but that's, it's always in this place in all of our manuscript history. So this is just where God threw in one more thing. It says, a man or woman who is a medium or necromancer shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones. Their blood shall be upon them, right? So they have engaged in a detestable practice. And so the land will testify and bring punishment upon them in the hands of the people. So that's where we're going to end off today here. But the idea, again, is this, that we are to be a distinct and separate people. As Christians, not like Israel was to be distinct in the way, what it ate, but we are to be distinct in the way we live our lives, our moral behavior. Israel also was to be distinct in its moral behavior from the nations around it. Right? And so what, how we worship, what we worship, and what marriages we will and will not engage in, certainly are still applicable to the church today, as is most of Leviticus 19. And the other point that I want to leave you with tonight is if you practice these things, these moral things in a thousand little ways, then when you are actually put to the test, right, because you have built up, so to speak, the, the, the muscle of virtue in your life, then you will um, be able to stand in the grace of Christ against that temptation as well. God always gives you a way to stand up under temptation, according to the Apostle Paul. And so practice little virtues in your life, telling the truth, worshiping God in, in holiness, right? living a life of moral purity, right? practice this in a thousand little ways so that when you're put to the test, when temptation comes, you, by the grace of Christ, will stand. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word for us tonight. It's a hard word, especially chapter 20, and people being put to death and exiled and childless and we can look at that and say, Lord, what are we supposed to do with this? But yet we remember one thing, and that is that you are still holy, and we are called to be your holy people. 
We're called to live in this world that give, in a way that gives you glory and then invite, invite others to put their faith in you. Father, may we remember to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbors ourselves. And Lord, if we do these things, then all will be well and all manner of things will be well. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.